The Nine Stages of Ego Development, Part 1. This is a two-part series. Maybe there might need to be a third part, but I hope to do it in two. A two-part series on cognitive development, how the human mind evolves and grows. So there's a certain sequence in which this happens, which we will be describing in much detail. In Part 1, we're going to cover the pre-conventional and conventional categories or stages of development. And then in part two, we're going to be covering the post-conventional and the transhuman stages of development. Really, you need to stick around for part two because part two is the most important one. This one, this episode, is just the setup. It's just the foundation because it would be weird to start with part two uh, because what we really need to talk about are the post-conventional and the transhuman stages. That's what's most relevant to your development. But still, you will also find much value in part one, so stick around. In fact, I should underscore that this is a foundational episode. These two episodes are going to be foundational. This is going to be like the, uh, the structure or a certain model that we're going to be using in all future work that we do on this channel. So make sure you watch this one and take it seriously. This can transform your life. This is basically a roadmap for the rest of your life for how your mind is going to develop. It's extremely significant, so don't overlook this. This is basically me sharing with you another developmental psychological model. So there's a field of psychology called developmental psychology, which specifically creates models and studies how various aspects of the human psyche evolve and develop over time. I've already shared a very elaborate model called Spiral Dynamics that most of you should be familiar with. If you're not, that's okay. You don't need to be. This is a standalone model here that I'll be presenting, and it's uh, it's from the work of a researcher by the name of Susan Cook Greuter. So I want to give her a lot of credit here. In fact, most of this episode, probably 90% of the content in this series, is going to be me just quoting her research paper to you. And the paper in particular here is called Nine Levels of Increasing Embrace in Ego Development, subtitle, A Full Spectrum Theory of Vertical Growth and Meaning Making. That's a mouthful. It doesn't tell you very much. Uh, don't worry, though. You'll get it all as uh, we keep exploring these different stages. I highly recommend that you go download this free research paper. It's not overly technical like some research papers are. It's quite easy to read. It's very illuminating. It's life transforming. It's rather long for a research paper. It's 90 pages long. Uh, but I recommend that you print this out. Don't just have it on your computer. Print it out. Sit there with a highlighter and a pen. Underline it as you're reading. You will find golden nuggets and hundreds of golden nuggets. The way she articulates these stages is incredible. It's really a work of genius. This paper needs to be uh, publicized and taught in all classrooms, but of course it's not. Nobody knows about it. So that's one of my functions here with Actualize.org is to bring you this amazing content that I find. Um, I'll have a link down below where you can go click and uh, find this PDF. So even if you watch this, I still highly recommend that you go download it and read it to make sure that you extract every last golden nugget that is there because I can't possibly do it justice even in these multi-hour long videos that I shoot. This will be one of the most important papers that you ever read in your life. All right, so let's get into the basics of what she calls ego development theory, EDT, ego development theory. This is an empirical scientific model grounded in sentence completion tests. So the way that this model was developed by Susan Cook Greuter is, of course, she was also aware of other models within development psychology, and she was sort of following in the footsteps of other great researchers. Uh, of course, if you've watched my Sprawl Dynamics series, then you're aware of Claire Graves, whose work was also based on a sort of sentence completion tests or various kinds of interviews that he did with, with, uh, with people. And uh, she did the sort of a same thing. So what she does basically is create uh, like a, 
a sample of different so sorts of sentence completions. She gives this out to various people in different countries and then collects the data and then goes through the data and categorizes it and sees what are the commonality commonalities between different people and different answers that they give. Can we make sense of what's really going on? There's a certain a certain order in which people answer these questions. How do they grow over time and so forth? So the first period of data collection for this particular model was done between 1980 and 1998. But then there was a second phase happening in the 2000s as well, and maybe a third phase, I don't know. Um, but you can see, you know, that's, that's like a, a solid 20 year chunk of, of data collection, if not more. So there's, there's nine levels of ego development here. It's important to stress that this is a model. Every scientific model has its limits. It's not going to be absolutely accurate. It's giving you a sort of an abstract, idealized picture of what's going on. Of course, in practice, the mind is so complex. There's so many variables happening in there that you can't possibly model all this perfectly. Uh, but still, you'll be amazed at how accurate this model can be for pegging yourself, your family members, and other people that you know. So what does this model actually model? It models how self-identity evolves over time. And by self-identity, of course, that's just another term for ego. And by ego, what we really mean is the very center of your entire life. So if we ask you, what is the center of your life? Your entire life, what does it revolve around? It revolves around what? You. You. That big fat ego sitting over there listening to me, making sense of the world. The owner of your life. That's the ego. That's your sense of identity. Now, most people, they take this identity for granted and they just assume, well, yeah, of course, yeah, there's me. That's my ego. I was born. I'm going to die. And that's just how it is. But that's not just how it is. And uh, furthermore, there are levels of maturity and development to this ego. So one of the common mistakes that is made within spiritual circles and spiritual teachings is that even when they do acknowledge the ego and its problematic aspects, uh, a lot of times it's, it's too simplistic in the other direction. So the pendulum swings away from ego to non-ego. And so then we kind of get caught up on this uh, rat race of trying to eliminate the ego, kill the ego, transcend the ego, and ego is bad, and all of its functions are bad, and uh, it, you know it doesn't even exist, it's illusory. Why even talk about the ego? Because it's just a, a fiction. That's how it's portrayed sometimes in spiritual circles. And so you might think, well, what's the point of even studying it? Because it's all just bullshit, it's all just illusion. Uh, well, not quite there are levels of maturity to an ego. And in fact, what most people need is not ego transcendence. We'll get there. That's going to be some of the later stages of this model. We'll get to ego transcendence. But that's, uh, you know, that's a very advanced thing for maybe 1% or 2% of the human population. For the rest, mostly what they're in need of, in search of, is just ego development and ego maturity. And so... That's what most of this model will be explaining. You see, there's a, it's not just a binary of you have an ego or you don't have an ego. It's a question of more of like, what, what kind of ego do you have? How sophisticated is it? How nuanced is it? How reactive is it? How dense is it? So you could kind of measure the ego in terms of its density, in terms of its sophistication and so forth. And so this model is explaining the various levels of sophistication of the human mind and psyche as it tries to understand reality, because that's a big function of, of what your ego is doing. Your ego is not just you sitting back and experiencing life, enjoying itself. Your ego is the thing which is bringing together and making sense of this field of phenomenon and experience that you are encountering, all the events and people and things, all the different beliefs and ideas that you're learning over your lifetime, what is making sense of that into some sort of cohesive narrative? That's the ego. And how it makes sense of that, this varies quite a lot, a lot more than people recognize, which is why this model is so powerful and so helpful, is that it shows you the different ways in which the ego can understand reality.
So sometimes, as I've talked about with the model of spiral dynamics and with Ken Wilber's models, integral theory, uh, we talk about different developmental lines. We talk about the cognitive line. We talk about developing your relationships. How how mature are you in your relationships? Maybe in your sexuality. Maybe in your uh, in your language. How you're using your language. Maybe in your emotions. There's a moral developmental line. So various kinds of lines. This model here is is primarily concerned with cognitive and me- mental development. Although it does also touch upon certain other lines, because usually when you're developing yourself along one of these lines, the other ones come along for the journey, although not perfectly. So you can be more evolved on certain lines than on others. Uh, So just keep that in mind. But mostly we're talking about mental and cognitive development here. So one of the core things that's being modeled here is the mind's ability to take perspective at greater and greater levels. It's an increased sophistication and capacity in perspective taking. The higher you go, the more developed you are, the higher your perspectives can be, the more inclusive they can be. And the lower you are, the narrower your perspectives are. It's also modeling how the mind relates to reality, how the mind interprets reality. These are all factors that many people never even think about as they go about living their life, that you can relate to reality in different ways, you can interpret it in different ways, very different ways that lead to an entirely different way of living life. And so if you want to really transform your experience of life, what needs to happen is that you need to transform how your mind relates to reality, thinks about reality, interprets reality, makes sense and meaning out of reality. So here's the first quote that I'll give you from Susan Cook Greuter. Each level of stage represents a distinct, qualitatively different, uniquely defined, and increasingly complex view of self and reality. A new reality for the subject, a new way of identifying as a self, and a new understanding and relationship of the world. End quote. Uh, So what does it mean to go up a level on this model? It means the following, quote, The whole previous meaning system is transformed and restructured into a new and more expansive and inclusive self-theory and theory of the world." End quote. So, one of the most important functions of the ego is meaning-making. And we'll be referring to this notion over and over again throughout these two episodes. Meaning-making. How do you make meaning out of the world? Because Inherently, the world has no meaning. It's the ego's job to create that meaning. And as it does so, it can do it in a, in a wide variety of ways, leading to all sorts of different outcomes and different ways of relating to reality. So the ego is constantly engaged in this battle of sense-making. And there's not just one way to do it. Interpretations can become increasingly more sophisticated. So it's not merely that you could have one set of beliefs or a different set of beliefs. So here, we're not concerned with the content of the mind. You might say something like, oh yeah, of course, Christians look at the world one way and Muslims look at the world a different way because they read different holy books and they believe in different teachers or different teachings and principles and so forth. But that's not really what we're interested in here. All of that I would call content. Rather, what we're interested in more of is structure, the structure of how your mind thinks of the world. In a certain sense, the structure of how a Christian and a fundamentalist Muslim look at the world is very similar, even though their content can be contradictory or different. The structure is still the same. The structure is still ideological, fundamentalist, and so forth. You see, if you want to understand that distinction between content and structure in more detail, see my... uh, episode, an advanced, very important episode that I shot called Content Versus Structure, where I go into a lot of detail explaining that distinction. Very powerful episode. So here we're looking at the structures of the mind, not the content of the mind. We don't care about any particular belief. We care about what the mind is doing. How self-aware is the mind of its own mechanisms, so to speak? We also see the ego as a storyteller. 
and the ego as an integrator of all aspects of experience. Because your experience of life is not this disjointed collection of events and things. It seems and it feels like one cohesive stream of consciousness. So the ego is, is what's responsible for holding that together. Here's another quote from Susan Cook Reuter on this topic. She says, quote, Our own strongly held values have to be renegotiated when we enter a new view of reality. In the extreme, we can say that with each transformation, we are actually entering a new reality with its own rules, laws, and language. For this reason, the relationship to almost any concept can be shown to differ along the developmental path. A person's understanding of power, feedback, time, love, integrity, and truth, for instance, all of these things change with increasing development. All right, so that's the setup. Now let's talk about these stages. So here are the stages. There are nine of them, and they have various labels, and uh, we're going to break them down into, into three categories, basically. The pre-conventional, the conventional, and the post-conventional. Then if you want, you can add a fourth category at the end called the transhuman or the transcendent category. Um, although sometimes I will lump that transcendent in with the post-conventional. So the pre-conventional includes three stages. One is called symbiotic. The next is called impulsive, and the next is called opportunistic. Now, the pre-conventional stages within the U.S. is about 5% of the population, adult population. Now, keep in mind, as I'm giving you some of these percentages, I'm taking these directly from Susan Cook Reuter's research. And the percentages, of course, vary depending on which country you sample. The United States is a relatively advanced, developed country. So, of course, you should expect more percentages towards the higher stages. If you're coming from a country like India, China, uh, Africa, somewhere in Africa, or in South America, in these places, of course, you're going to have much larger percentages of the lower stages. So, just keep that in mind. And in fact, you have to be very careful with how you sample this stuff because there can be sampling biases. You know, like... If you're going to go sample college kids in America, yeah, you're going to get an elevated, overly elevated picture of the stages because just there's a bias, you know, there's a sampling bias just in the fact that you're a college student already. You have to jump through many hurdles to get there and you're going to already have to be at a relatively high stage just to be admitted into college. Whereas if you go and you sample people in, in, in some ghetto or in the hood somewhere, some uh, impoverished region of America, yeah, you're going to get a lot more of the pre-conventional stages. Then the, the second category is the conventional stages. This is the bulk of what most people are in the world and in, in most developed countries. And even in, in, in many underdeveloped countries, a lot of people fall into the conventional uh, category. Here we have the conformist, the expert, and the achiever. So the conventional category comprises about 75 to 80 percent of the adult U.S. population. And this is what most people take as sort of the baseline. They assume that because this is how they were raised, this was probably the kind of environment they went to for school, for church, for university, if they went to university, or their job, or... Uh, their family and friends and colleagues that they surround themselves with, they just sort of assume that conventional thinking, the conventional stage of development or category of stages of development, that this is basically sort of what defines the parameters of, of the human mind, of what is considered normal, of what is considered possible. Most people don't think that anything beyond the conventional stages is even possible. So it's rare to even encounter the possibility of post-conventional stages which we'll be talking about in part two. Okay, so this kind of creates a sort of a false sense of reality. You can really get stuck in the conventional area because when 80% of adults around you are like this, you don't know any better. And anyone who's below you, you're going to think they're crazy or stupid. And anyone who's above you, it's going to be so rare that you're going to think that they're kind of woo-woo or far out there 
and you're probably not going to interact with them very much because you're just hanging around in a different circle with, with friends who are at the conventional level. But then you can get into the post-conventional, which comprises about 15 to 20% of the U.S. adult population. And here we have the pluralist stage, followed by the autonomous slash strategist stage, followed by the construct aware slash ego aware slash magician stage. Now, some of these stages have multiple names and labels, so just kind of bear with that. Uh, I know it can be a little bit confusing sometimes. And then finally, we have the transcendent category, which has the unitive stage. This is very rare. Even in the U.S., it's less than 1% of the adult population. The unitive stage is about half a percent in Susan Cook Greuter's uh, assessments. And I would probably put it as maybe even rarer than that if you really go out there and take a full sample of the entire adult population and you don't specifically take college students or people living in, in major urban areas and so forth. So now we're going to be talking about what each of these stages are. That's the bulk of, of our work here is to explain all these because these are just labels don't mean anything to you unless we explain them in, in detail. Now, I want to warn you, you're going to start to want to match up these stages with those of spiral dynamics, if you've already studied that model, which most of you probably have. If you haven't heard of spiral dynamics at all yet, that's great. Uh, you'll take this in with fresh eyes, so to speak, and fresh ears. But those of you who know spiral dynamics, I encourage you here now to be a little bit more sophisticated in your thinking and not just to simplistically try to match colors from spiral dynamics with these different labels here, because even though you're going to see a lot of similarity, I want you to kind of get in the frame of mind of being able to look at the world through different models and different lenses at different times. So you can put on your spiral dynamics lenses and look at the world that way. And then you can take those off and you can put on a different set of lenses and you will see different things. That's one of the things that a most more advanced mind can do is that it can do that. Whereas uh, a less developed mind only looks at the world through one set of glasses, one set of lenses, and it can't take them off to pull it on and try on another one, right? So be careful conflating spiral dynamics with this model here. They should stand on their own. And then later, after you're done studying this model, then you can start to make comparisons and, and so forth. But at this point, I would resist, um, I would resist making direct comparisons until you take all this in with fresh eyes. For the next hour or two, as you're watching these episodes in this series, just forget that you ever learned about spiral dynamics. Take this all in freshly, and I guarantee you that you will learn additional things. This will enrich in your understanding of spiral dynamics. All right, so let's get into these stages. Stage one is called symbiotic. This stage, there's not much to say about it. It's extremely primitive. This is basically what is found in infants who are just, you know, under a few years old. This is a stage in which the ego hasn't even developed yet because when you start out life, you don't start off life as an ego. You start out life as just this undifferentiated mass of phenomenon and it has to be made sense of and that process takes a few years to start to get going. Language has to come online. You have to start to think. You have to start to recognize distinctions and draw, literally invent distinctions between self, other, and world. So at the symbiotic stage, there's a very primitive sense of self, other, and world. Uh, a baby basically doesn't know the difference between itself, the world, and others. It takes months and years for it to develop those capacities and abilities. Uh, sometimes people just think that, oh, well, a baby is born, a baby has a sense of self. No, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, another problem here is that some spiritual people will make the mistake of thinking like, oh, well, a baby is enlightened. A baby is born enlightened. No, it isn't. A baby is not born with any sense of self. A baby doesn't know that it's God. Uh, a baby is not in some you know super state of high consciousness. Uh, a baby is basically like an animal. It's, it hasn't even differentiated its sense of self yet out from the world. So this can make it appear as though it's enlightened, but it's not really enlightened. Yeah, sure, it, it's 
it's very present. It's in the moment. It doesn't have a, a very deep sense of history and time. And it's not very, you know, the mind isn't loaded with a bunch of baggage and, and beliefs and stuff. That's good. In that sense, it's a little bit closer to enlightenment, we might say, because enlightenment kind of takes you to a, a state of going beyond the mind. But you shouldn't confuse uh, this symbiotic stage with the unitive stage, which is going to be the final stage of this whole model. So they're, they're vastly, vastly different. Uh, so at this symbiotic stage, the mind and the, the individual is completely dependent on parents and culture. It can't survive without them. It's absorbing and rapidly learning from the culture. It's not able to evaluate what it's learning from the culture or what the parents are teaching it. So if the parents are teaching it some kind of nonsense, it'll just completely accept it as the truth. It doesn't have any kind of discernment ability. And so here indoctrination starts happening immediately as the baby is born and it starts to learn, it goes to kindergarten and so forth. Uh, it starts to interact with parents. It's quickly adopting the mental categories of its culture and its parents and whoever it's hanging around with. And it's not questioning any of those. It's just struggling to learn language, struggling to make sense of the world, struggling to make sense of, of conceptual distinctions between self, other, and world. Um, and it's a struggle to define oneself and individuate oneself from one's environment. So that's all we'll say about the symbiotic stage. It's uh, it's not really something that's prevalent in adults. This is this is not even in kids, really. We're talking about babies here. The second stage is the impulsive stage. This is uh, this is more about where toddlers are found, maybe kids that are between five and ten years old something like that. This is a sensory motor stage where the kid is running around and trying to make sense of the world through uh, sensation and movement by grabbing things, feeling things, playing with things, interacting with the environment and trying to make sense of how stuff works. This is the stage at which you have your earliest memories, probably, of being born and being alive. You have a sense of a rudimentary sense of self, of being human. You have a, a, a rudimentary sense of time. You're just beginning to make sense of time and you have a very crude sense of, of history. Uh, but that this is all coming online very quickly. And of course, you're absorbing so much from your culture, again, without critically analyzing any of it. So you have to be careful that whatever you absorb from your culture at this stage, it's going to form the foundation or the operating system of your mind for the rest of your life. Here, the mind thinks in crude dichotomies, things are good or bad, clean or dirty, people are nice or mean, simple stuff like that. Uh, the mind here doesn't have many ways to deal with setback. It's still totally dependent on others for its survival. Uh, you're governed by trying to fulfill basic needs, uh, learning how to follow basic, basic rules of the human world. Uh, there's little recourse other than crying, screaming, and withdrawing. It's easy for the mind at this stage to get overwhelmed and to feel abandoned. And so at this point, the mind is still extremely fragile. Um, if this toddler is in a difficult situation where there's screaming and fighting and suffering and abuse, this mind, this psyche will get very screwed up. It will develop se severe dysfunctions because it doesn't have any kind of sophisticated way of dealing or coping with these sorts of adult problems, we might say. So at this point, you know, this is why kids and toddlers are treated like kids and toddlers. We don't tell them all the truths of reality, you know, war and, and rape and murder and terrorism. You know, we, we don't talk about these things to toddlers for this reason because they don't have the capacity to really understand and make sense of these things, and it would be too shocking and uh, uh, probably traumatizing uh, for such a mind to you know, come to grapple with such things. So this is, um, this is again, a stage that mostly you find uh, toddlers in, kids, not adults. Other people at this stage are seen as objects to gratify one's needs not as people who have their own needs. So, of course, toddlers and kids, they tend to be very, very selfish in the sense that they're, they're not considerate of the agendas of other people. They're only acting out their own agenda. 
Uh, the self here is still not fully differentiated out. There's a constant and vague sense of threat and insecurity, which is why you know the child runs to mommy or daddy when uh, something scares him or something freaks her out. Uh, there can be adults at this stage, but if they are here, they probably have severe mental handicaps or deficiencies, maybe genetic disorders or uh, uh, injuries, head injuries that they suffered in their life. So basically, adults at this stage need the guidance of guardians and uh, adult supervision in order to survive because they can't, uh, they won't be able to make it on their own. And that's it for that stage. Next, we have the opportunist. Now, this is the first stage where you find a significant number of adults, especially in less developed parts of the world. The opportunist. Here, the mind makes use of magical thinking to make sense of the world. At this stage, individuals are quite what we might call uncivilized. Arguments and logic are useless here because the mind isn't capable of those things. The mind is very impulsive. The mind is very instinctual. It's still uh, very animal-like and very, very self-centered in the sense that it doesn't take into account the needs and suffering of others. That's something that only comes online in later stages of development. The mind here is not capable of insight into itself or others in any psychological sense. So not only does it not make sense of others' psyches, it doesn't make sense of its own psyche. It just acts out without self-reflection at all. There is an awareness now of how to manipulate others to get one's basic physical needs met and basic crude emotional needs. Uh, there's a, an awareness of one's own size and strength which can be used for intimidation if one feels strong enough to intimidate others to get what one wants. Or if you size up others and you see that they're bigger than you, stronger than you, and more intimidating than you, then you're aware of that. You can, you can see that. And then you will, you, know, you will adopt various kinds of defenses and other strategies to, to avoid getting overrun by those people. Life is seen here as a zero-sum game. Uh, if I win, you lose. If, if uh, I lose, you win. People at this opportunist stage are people of action, not thought or planning. So a lot of times they will act in ways that we, as from, from a higher elevation, from a higher stage, would consider as irresponsible or irrational uh, or impulsive. And we might wonder, like, how could you do something so stupid? But to them, they, they don't think very far into the future. They're just thinking about right now, thinking about the next hour, the next day, and they're not thinking about weeks and months into the future what the consequences of their action are. So there's not a lot of planning in their life. They're just kind of like flying by the seat of their pants. And oftentimes this gets them into a lot of trouble because they can, for example, get involved with hard drugs without thinking about the consequences of what that will do and how that will you know destroy their brain chemistry or how that will ruin their career or job opportunities, or how that might get them in jail, or whatever. Uh, there's a sense of self as having two sides. Uh, a real inner self, which is me, and then there's a false sense or front that I put out there for others to shield myself and to be able to manipulate others. So this kind of duality is created. And so there can be manipulation and lying and dishonesty on that on the fake front for the sake of getting what the real inner self wants. But of course, this leads to problematic consequences down the road because now there's this kind of split in the psyche between the, the, the mask one wears and then one's real true self. At this stage, rules are recognized, social rules, but are mostly followed only for immediate advantage or to avoid punishment. Uh, at this stage, one is socially invested in, con in the concrete, visible world of things that one can own. So it's kind of like, can I own it? Can I feel it? Can I display it? Otherwise, it doesn't have much value to me. At this stage, self-respect is equivalent to my ability to control others. 
So if I can control and manipulate others, then I can respect myself. And if I can't, then I don't respect myself. I feel like I'm inadequate. At this stage, others are always to blame, never oneself, because I can't see how my own mind is creating many of the problems that I'm causing. At this stage, one is prone to anger when frustrated, and the anger tends to be loud and projected outward. So at this stage, there's not a lot of suppressing of emotions. The emotions are kind of worn on the person's sleeve, and they can lash out. And uh, in this way, they don't really fit in sometimes with society, with polite society. And they can be seen as sort of barbaric or uncivilized because they're just acting out. They haven't learned how to control themselves and how to calm themselves down and how to conform to the expectations of, of polite society, so to speak. That happens at the next stage. At this stage, actions are only bad if one is caught or punished. There's a shamelessness and a lack of guilt at this stage because one is just acting out one's impulses. And like an animal, an animal doesn't have much shame or guilt. Like when a dog craps on the carpet, it doesn't really have a sense that it did something wrong because it hasn't gone through a sort of a civilizing process that... Uh, that humans need to go through, and, and so hasn't yet this stage. So this stage shows little remorse when it is caught. And if it is caught, it tends to blame others for its own shortcomings, and it does this as a way to protect itself. Because if I have to take responsibility for my own impulses and behaviors, this is a burden in a sense. You can see for the mind, this is a burden. It's much easier just to take a crap wherever you want, spit wherever you want, say whatever you want, emote however you want without following any rules. You see, that's sort of an easy way to live. Most animals live this way. It's a little bit harder to now take responsibility for those actions, sort of take consideration of, of other people's needs and feelings, and to start to see, you know, what the problem might be of, uh, you know, taking a shit in the middle of your classroom. Uh, and you might be surprised that, well, how could someone need to develop their mind in order to understand that. Isn't that obvious that taking a shit in the middle of the classroom is, is bad? And the answer is no, that's not obvious. That's obvious to you because you've already grown through these stages and you take them for granted, but it's not obvious for many people. In fact, I've, I've heard uh, anecdotal stories of how in China they have this problem. <laughs> I think I heard this from Joe Rogan, so I, I don't know how credible this is, but in China, supposedly they have this problem where, you know, over the last 50 or 60 or 70 years, China has gone through a rapid development where a lot of people who were just like millions of people, tens of millions of people were living in poverty just as basic, uneducated, illiterate farmers. And now, you know, through rapid industrialization, they've lifted millions out of poverty. Some of them have become, uh, you know, reasonably successful and wealthy. But uh, in a sense, they're not, they're not fully civilized in a sense because they have this problem in China where uh, they will have people just take a shit in the middle of a shopping mall promenade. They have like apparently videos of this where rather than going to the toilet, I mean, there's a toilet right there. You know, most malls have toilets and restroom signs. But some of these Chinese are so uncivilized uh, and so impulsive, probably because they're at this stage of development, that they don't really respond to that. So the idea of actually following the, the, you know, the toilet signs to go and go through the hassle of actually going to the toilet, rather than just taking a shit right where I am right now because I want to, th to them, that's an inconvenience. <laughs> they would rather just take a shit. And so apparently they do so. <laughs> Just goes to show you that the, this stuff is not just theory. You, you find examples of it in, in real life. It helps to explain how that is possible. See, when, you know, when most people see an example like that, they can't make sense of it because they don't have these models to understand the lower stages. And then also they can't explain the higher stages as well when they see higher stage individuals. So at this stage, uh, the individual tends to create a lot of hurt feelings in others, of course, because they don't really care. They're too selfish to care or to even understand what they're doing. They don't see the collateral damage that they cause. Relationships at this stage tend to be very volatile, uh, very immature, very childish. 
uh, and they easily blow up and, and you can get into a relationship. The relationship could be very passionate. It could last for a month or two or for a year and, it, and then it just blows up and it continues to blow up and blow up no matter which relationships you get into because there's a fundamental lack of responsibility taking for one's own emotions and behaviors in this relationship. The other one is always to blame and so you get these uh, kind of dysfunctional, abusive, highly codependent, toxic relationships at this stage, especially if both people are at this level. Or oftentimes what happens is that the woman, for example, could be one level above, but the guy she's dating or marrying is one level below at this opportunist stage, and then she can't make sense of why this guy is abusing her and being an asshole and doing this criminal activity and so forth. You know, she's trying to to reason with him because she's at a you know, one stage above and uh, she's beyond this, but he isn't. Uh, but but she's she's too attracted to him and she's too in love with him and she cares about him too much. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, that's what creates sort of a classic abusive relationship that many women fall into. At this stage, there's little reflection on one's own emotions. One is acting out emotions rather than introspecting about them or labeling them. So one can be angry, but not even really be aware of one's anger, for example. Uh, at this stage, things are unpredictable, unreasonable, manipulative, and exploitative. Those are the kind of tendencies of these people. Uh, success can be achieved from this stage in business. So it's not, uh, it's not like this kind of person cannot be successful in the world. This person can be successful, especially though when business is about opportunism and unilateral power. When opportunism, opportunism and unilateral power is rewarded, that's where these people can really excel and do quite well for themselves. Uh, and oftentimes the business here will be shady business, illegal business, scamming, con artistry, theft, Ponzi schemes, this, this kind of business. It's not like a, a very conscious way of doing business. It's business as exploitation to get what I want. If I can fleece my customers, what's the problem? I'm going to get more money and then I can use that money to go buy drugs or have more sex or whatever, buy a boat, that sort of thing. Uh, showing weakness at this stage is seen as dangerous. So there can be sort of a posturing going on to avoid showing weakness. There can be a sense as follows, that the more others know about me, the more they can take advantage of me. So one is sort of trying to hide one's true self from others so that it doesn't get taken advantage of. Morality at this stage is oftentimes non-existent. It just doesn't compute for the mind. Because for morality to come online, that, that's further stages that are able to take the perspectives of other people, which this stage cannot do. There's a lot of black and white thinking here. The problem-solving style of this stage, you know, if you come to this person with your problems, the person will just say something like, that's your problem, not my problem. Problem solved. Because the, there's only a problem if it's a problem for me. If there's a problem for you, that's your problem, not my problem. So there's not a lot of empathy going on here. These people are not going to help you really to solve your problems. They only care about themselves. The defense mechanisms at this stage are blaming, lots of blaming, uh, distortions to minimize one's own anxiety, fantasy, acting out, projection, and twisting the truth around to basically suit one's own self. Maybe you know some of these types of people who just, they don't have a concept of truth. To them, the truth is just whatever is going to help them to survive. That is what's common here. There's a preoccupation with domination, gaining control and advantage, and deceptive maneuvers. Uh... These people tend to be self-protective, bullheaded, have tunnel vision, and are constantly blowing up and blaming others for their own blow-ups. Uh, there's a showing of prejudice. These people polarize arguments rather than trying to find common ground, and they try to exploit others' weaknesses because they don't see a problem with that from their point of view. 
the language style of these sorts of opportunist people uh, is often to use physical words, simple, straightforward language for non-physical concepts. So they're not able to really do a lot of complex, sophisticated, abstract thinking. They try to deal with the world at a, on a material, gross level. Uh, negative emotions are expressed loudly and unabashedly. And basically, this mind is concerned with its own little concrete world. Which now takes us out of the pre-conventional into the conventional category. So those were the three pre-conventional stages. Now we're getting into the conventional. And here the first stage is called the conformist or the diplomat. And here what's going on is the ego mind is moving beyond the previous opportunist stage and it's discovering a new we space. The space of us as a group, as a community. Now I am part of a community and now it's not just about my own needs being met, but also about fitting in and playing by the rules. So here the ego wants to play by the rules. And so it goes all the way, swings this pendulum all the way towards group-centered thinking. And the groups here are only of two types. It's very simple. It's very crude. There's an in-group and there's an out-group. Us and them. There's my family, my tribe, my team, my group, my nation, my party, my company. And then there's everybody else who's different and who's wrong and who's stupid and who's evil. Everything fits into these two simple categories. There's a confused boundary between self and the in-group. So if I'm, for example, uh, a Muslim, fundamentalist Muslim at this conformist stage, I'm completely bought into Islam. And there's not much of a, of a, of a distinction made between myself, my own identity, and Islam as a belief system or as a philosophy, that distinction isn't made. So when someone criticizes Islam or the Prophet Muhammad or whatever, I take that very personally because that feels like an attack on me. You're attacking my tribe, you're attacking my team, you're attacking my religion, you're attacking me. Because there is no distinction between like, well, I'm an individual and I happen to subscribe to the philosophy of Islam, which is a philosophy and there can be different kinds, different interpretations of it. No. I am Islam. My version of Islam is the only version of Islam. That's how the mind thinks at this conformist stage. Being part of a group offers protection and a share of its power, but the price to pay is for this inclusion is loyalty and obedience. So at this stage, uh, there's a lot of loyalty and obedience going on. There is a deep fear of ostracism and being shunned because it's important to fit into the group without which survival could be severely hampered. You might remember going through this stage as a child when you were in elementary school. I remember I did in the sense that um, I, I really cared a lot about fitting in, about being perceived as normal, about not being shunned, being part of the cool kids, that sort of stuff. So. Many children and teens, all up through high school and maybe even college, they go through this stage uh, when they start to, you know, hang out in groups. It becomes important what your friends think of you. Everything gets filtered through your friends. You're not thinking independently. You're not trying to be a unique individual. You're trying to, you know, do what your friends are doing. And then what your friends are doing are probably what other people are doing in the media or the music you listen to, you know, whatever the rappers are doing, whatever's cool on TV, whatever is hip in the culture, it's, it's a very conformist stage. And one's identity becomes about that. What kind of music do you listen to? Do you listen to the cool music or the lame music? Do you watch the cool movies or the lame movies? Are you a dork or are you one of the cool kids? And there's this sort of thing. And then your survival becomes all about that. And if you, if you fail to integrate this stage properly, then you're going to feel like a loner. You're going to be feel left out. Uh, you're not going to be able to socialize very well. 
this stage uh, accepts norms without introspection or questioning. This stage is very sheep-like. So when people talk about sheeple, this is what they mean, this conformist stage. This is the sheeple stage. There is a relishing in group dependency. The world is divided into simple external absolute categories of people and things. Uh, people are either perceived as your allies or your enemies in this sort of binary sense. There's not a lot of gray. It's very black and white thinking still here at this stage. These people feel honored to be part of a group with high status. And so there's a lot of energy put into gaining more and more status. Becoming cooler, rising up the ladder, up the hierarchy. It's a very hierarchical system. There's a sense of being part of the special chosen few, the in-group, which is, of course, superior to everybody else from the perspective of this group. This gives the ego a sense of love and acceptance and approval. So now the ego's love is not just coming from its mother and its father. It's coming from its peer group as well. In fact, this becomes an overriding, more important source of love. Uh, and then that's why there can be sort of a rebellion against the parents and so forth. There's a sense that our group's truth is the only truth and the ultimate truth, and everybody else is doomed or evil. And the reason that there is this sense is because you have to understand that at this level of cognitive development, the mind is unable to take the perspectives of other groups. There's not a sense of like, well, there are Christians who have one perspective on the world. There are Muslims who have another perspective on the world. Then there are atheists who have a third perspective on the world. There are agnostics who are, have a fourth perspective on the world. And all of them have their pros and cons. It's like, no, there is, yes, there's all those other groups. At this stage, you can see those other groups, but you're only looking at the world from your own perspective. You can't truly see what it means to be a, a Muslim if you're a Christian or what it means to be a Christian if you're a Muslim at this stage. You're completely locked into the paradigm of whatever you were indoctrinated with by your group and your culture and your society. So there's no ability to step outside of your group's perspective. And because of this, how does one explain the existence of all these other groups who have very different perspectives, different beliefs, different value systems, and different behaviors? You explain it as them being evil and them being wrong. So. For example, if a fundamentalist Christian travels to India and tries to study the different Hindu traditions and religions and culture, they're not going to get very far because they're always going to be looking at them from within their Christian framework. They're not going to be able to step outside of Christianity and look at various Hindu deities and traditions and practices in its own right, on its own terms. There's no sense of relativity here at this stage. It's very absolutistic. And so when a Christian or a Westerner, you know, goes to India and looks at these Hindus, they will see them as uncivilized, as barbaric, as being, you know, into witchcraft and sorcery and heathenism and worshiping false idols and this sort of stuff. Because that's what it looks like from within the Christian paradigm. Now, of course, Christianity is not only limited to this stage. Christianity can be much more advanced, much more sophisticated, but we're just talking about fundamentalist religion here. Basically, any fundamentalist religion falls into this stage. And the kind of spirituality that happens at this stage is very material. So these fundamentalists, even though it might seem like they're spiritual, in a certain sense, they're not very spiritual because their spirituality is highly material. When they think about heaven or hell, they're thinking about physical, material places that one goes to. Heaven is filled with mountains of gold and uh, sexy virgins and fast cars, and God is, a, is, a, is going to be sitting there. He's an actual man sitting on a gold throne with diamonds, wearing a crown, holding a scepter with a big beard, and he, and he, you know, he looks exactly the way that I imagine he does. He's a human. He will talk to me and you know, tell me that I've been good and that I followed his rules. That's the kind of sense. And then hell, 
Hell is a literal place that you go to. The devil, Satan, is actually real. He's got horns. He's colored red. He's got a pointy tail. And literally in hell, uh, you will be, you know, burned with fire and all sorts of stuff like that. It's material. There's no sense of possibility for this kind of mind that maybe heaven, when Jesus was talking about heaven, he wasn't talking about a physical place you go to. Maybe Jesus was using that as a metaphor for an internal state of mind. No, 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 no. This, this doesn't compute at this stage. Nor does hell compute as an internal state of mind. Maybe what hell is, is your egoic style of existence. Again, that doesn't compute at this stage because everything is taken literally rather than metaphorically. This is why this stage easily confuses many advanced spiritual teachings and it sort of brings them down to a very crude, gross material level. And here, spirituality can even involve ideas like earning lots of money. So some Christians in these, these prosperity gospel preachers, you know, they, they, will, they will talk about how earning lots of money is really God's sign that you are the chosen one. That's how they justify their, their chasing of money. Um, at this stage, the mind cannot understand that other groups hold absolute beliefs as well. And if you have a bunch of different groups all holding absolute beliefs, how do you know that your group has the right one? What are the chances? The chances are pretty low if you think about it just probabilistically. This doesn't compute for the mind yet. The mind at this stage cannot distinguish between belief and reality. Belief is taken as reality. There's no distinction between belief and experience either. There's no sense of recognition that beliefs can be wrong. The idea that you can fervently believe something, but that then it is wrong. Just that notion doesn't really compute at this stage. If I believe it, how can it be wrong? That's how the mind thinks here. The mind at this stage tries to uphold tradition and avoid rocking the boat in order to fit in. Feedback here is experienced as an attack, as critique of wrongdoing. So these kinds of minds are not good at taking feedback sort of constructive criticism. They will take it personally as them not fitting in well enough. The mind here does not have a strong personal opinion to express about things because it's so preoccupied with fitting in. It doesn't evaluate things independently. It doesn't really have its own independent moral system or a set of principles by which it operates in the world. It just moves with the herd, and its notion of what is right and good is whatever the herd is doing. There's no independent sense of right and wrong. The mind at this stage is not ready to stand up against the group. So if my group is doing something heinous or something what we would consider immoral, like if I'm part of a military unit and the military unit now starts to you know commit war crimes, I'm not going to be able to stand up at this stage and challenge them and say, hey guys, what are you doing? You're, you're, coming, you're, you're killing civilians, you're shooting at civilians, this is wrong, we shouldn't do this. this. This doesn't happen at this stage. That requires a higher level of cognitive development. So at this stage, I will actually join in with the group and I will participate with them in the war crimes and I will justify it as good because anything our group does by definition is good because we have the absolute best superior perspective on the world. And if we're killing civilians, that means those civilians deserve it. The mind will justify in whatever ways necessary, it will do any kind of mental gymnastics to justify this kind of action. This is what leads to a lot of atrocities, genocide, uh, you know, religious violence, uh, bigotry, racism, and so forth. Uh, you know, if all of my neighbors own slaves, then I'll own slaves too. And it'll be good and normal because, hey, if if God didn't want us to own slaves, then we wouldn't own them, right? Like if, if God, I mean, we're the chosen people and if we're good Christians and we're, we're all slave owners, then that means owning slaves must be exactly what God wants. 
There's no sense of like sitting down and thinking through like, wait a minute, maybe the things I've been told about what God wants, maybe that's not really what God wants. The mind doesn't work like that at this stage. It's too conformist. At this stage, the mind likes to take on preset roles in the group. So many organizations at this stage, like churches, um, the military, traditional hierarchical organizations, or the government, uh, they have fixed, predefined roles. I enter this role, I do what is required of me there. There's not a lot of creative thinking going on. There's not a lot of independent evaluating or analysis. I'm just going to do what needs to be done. And uh, it's, it's a very sort of simplistic way to do work. So, you know, if I'm going to go sign up for a church, maybe I'm going to get into missionary work. I'm going to become a missionary. I'm going to go do exactly what the, you know, the instructions tell me on how to be a missionary. I'm not going to innovate. I'm not going to deviate. Uh, that's why a lot of these sorts of conformist people they gravitate towards the military, towards traditional roles like this. They also like traditional family roles. So they like the idea of I'm the provider husband or I'm the caretaker wife and I'm raising the children while my husband is out there providing for the children. And those are our roles. We know our roles. It's very clear. Uh, we're not going to blur those boundaries in any ways. I'm a man. She's a woman. This kind of thinking. Um... And this is why these sorts of people have difficulty dealing with blurring of boundaries between roles, whether these are social roles or um, cultural roles, roles at work, um, gender roles, this sorts of stuff. They want these to be rigid and absolute. Uh, morality at this stage is black and white. Every decision, every idea, every person, every action fits into either good or bad. There's no gray. You're either on God's side or you're not. You're either uh, uh, working for the good guys or you're an, you're an evil devil. Action here is carried out with absolute conviction because the mind's worldview is so certain, it's almost like you can, you can imagine the mind as either being a fluid like a, a big bag of water, like a water balloon, big water balloon, you know, jiggles around. Or you can imagine the mind as a concrete solid block. Like if we take that water balloon and we stick it in the refrigerator, freeze it, it's just a solid block. It doesn't move. Uh, that's how the, the mind is at this stage. It's very, very stubborn. It's very, very closed minded. And because of this, there are certain advantages. One of those advantages is that you don't have to doubt yourself very much. You're so convinced that you're on the good side and that anything you do is good and that you can do no wrong that, of course, you can go out there. You can, you can, you can do some crazy things, some far out things that won't be possible at higher stages because you're so convinced that you're right. Of course, this can lead to disastrous consequences because there's a lack of self-reflection and self-doubt, self-skepticism. There's no sense at this stage that the mind can be tricking itself. There's a strong sense of guilt and shame at this stage because those are the primary tools by which the mind conforms. It feels guilty and shameful when it doesn't follow along with the herd. That's what keeps it in line. There's actually a pride in conformity here. So like in the military, they take pride and how well they're able to conform and follow the instructions to the letter. And the military will try to instill that in you, you know, through boot camp and so forth. Here, the mind is confused and threatened by different perspectives, diversity, complexity, paradox, and uh, multiculturalism. Because the mind is so rigid and so fixed in its worldview, it has a difficult time dealing with anything that contradicts that worldview. So different perspectives, different races, different ethnicities, different genders, different sexual orientations, transgender people, homosexual people, different cultures, different cuisines, different backgrounds, different ways of thinking, paradox, all of this is very threatening to the mind. Because as soon as the mind starts to take seriously other perspectives and diversity and multiculturalism, all of a sudden, 
this creates a, 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 a big sense of responsibility. See, with every stage, you're taking on more and more responsibility for how your mind is creating and constructing reality. At this stage, there's no sense that the mind is constructing reality. At this stage, reality is this solid, firm thing. The problem, though, is that it, reality is constantly evolving, changing, and morphing. Society is evolving. Culture is evolving. All religions evolve. Language is evolving. Science is evolving. Human understanding is evolving. The human body and organism is also evolving. Uh, technology, new technology is, is coming online every, every year and every decade. So in a constantly evolving world like this, how does someone with a very rigid mindset, how do they survive? Well, there's only two options, basically. One option is to open oneself up to this evolution and to accept different perspectives and different cultures and so forth, and then to try to grapple and deal with all that. But the problem is that that, that that takes a lot of responsibility and emotional labor because now all of a sudden I have to question whether my, you know, my Christian beliefs, whether they're all true or not. As soon as I even let in a little, a little shred of doubt, maybe the Bible wasn't written by God. Maybe the Bible was written by humans who were fallible and who misinterpreted some of the things Jesus said. Maybe the Bible was written by people who didn't even know Jesus. The, you know, as soon as I start to entertain these ideas, this, is, this becomes so threatening because my whole sense of reality and sense of self was grounded on conforming to this belief system that I held as absolutely true, and now you're telling me that it could all be nonsense? This is extremely threatening. It can be very painful. And so a lot of times what the mind does is rather than opening up, it doubles down and it closes up. It denies all these other perspectives. It denies the validity of diversity and complexity and multiculturalism, and it, it instead demonizes these things. And so it just says, well, clearly all of that is evil. All of that is sinfulness. And that's a very convenient way of not having to research and to look into all those things. You know, evolution, well, that's the work of the devil. And But what about Islam? Well, that's also the work of the devil. And what, what about Hinduism? That's also the work of the devil. What about the Buddha? Yeah, he was the devil too. <laughs> that, that's very convenient because then you don't have to study any of that stuff. Studying that stuff and trying to integrate it into your worldview is very challenging if you're a fundamentalist Christian. And don't think that this applies only to Christians. I'm just using Christianity here as, as one example. But you see this with fundamentalist Hinduism, you see this with fundamentalist Islam, you see this even with fundamentalist Buddhists, they fall into this trap. Sexuality tends to be suppressed and denied out of fear and shame at this stage. Sexuality is treated like a sort of an animalistic instinct that needs to be controlled. And because of this, a lot of times there develops a sort of a sexual shadow uh, because uh, these sexual impulses, you know, they're very strong they're not going to go away. In general, you have all sorts of animal impulses, but you haven't fully learned how to control them. So at this stage, you're just kind of suppressing them and you're denying that they even exist. And you're sort of, uh, you're not really in touch with your feelings and your emotions very well. And so this can uh, manifest itself in all sorts of toxic and dysfunctional ways where rather than just being open about your sexuality and being comfortable with it, you're denying it and suppressing it, but of course you can't fully contain it so it'll pop up somewhere else. This is where you see, you know, uh, sexual abuse in the church and uh, a lot of these pastors and so forth. They actually, even though they speak about how evil homosexuality is, they themselves end up being homosexuals, of course, in the closet, in secret. Um, and then eventually it spills out into the public and it turns into a scandal. So this sorts of stuff, or they have sorts of weird sexual perversions and and deviances, which are only strengthened by the fact that they're suppressing and denying, because on the surface, you're trying to be you know, the good moral boy or girl. They don't want to come off as a slut or as being sexually promiscuous or as being homosexual or as, you know, not being clearly in one category of man or, or, or woman. And so that they struggle with that. There's a lot of internal hidden guilt and shame underneath the sort of smile that they put on for everybody else in order to fit in. Socially, one must fit in and be liked at this stage. Therefore, you must be nice, pleasant, and accommodating. You must be neat. You must present an outward appearance of cleanliness and orderliness. 
even though on the inside you can be a total mess. Huh. Uh, these people value being nice and helpful to others. That's how they fit in. At least within their in-group. As far as their out-group goes, they can be very vicious and because uh, they don't even consider those people to be human. They're subhuman. Questioning truth at this stage can be seen as treason or sin. So if you take a fundamentalist Muslim and you just sit down and try to have a conversation with him and try to, you know, open his mind to the possibility that, you know, maybe, maybe Islam isn't the ultimate. Maybe there are other philosophies that are better. Uh, do you want to consider and explore some of those other philosophies? A fundamentalist Muslim can't do that. In his mind, that's treason. That's sin. If he was to do that, that would be like listening to the devil. And of course, he will perceive you as a devil for trying to lure him away from his one true ultimate Islam. People at this stage tend to be very judgmental because they need to be in order to protect themselves from having to explore other diverse perspectives. Uh, this is the mind's way of shutting out all the evidence that is contrary to his worldview. And at this stage, the worldview is so limited that it can't deal with all of the global complexity that exists today in the 21st century. So these people struggle very much to live in the 21st century because they have to deny a lot of stuff. They have to deny evolution. They have to deny uh, changes in the climate. They have to deny the fact that sexual identity is a fluid thing. They have to deny that different cultures have have different strengths and weaknesses and that Western culture may not be the best. There may be other cultures that are superior. For example, if you take a Christian and you try to explain to him, you know, fundamentalist Christian, you try to explain to him some of the benefits and strengths of, of Hinduism. You know, Hinduism has a rich, deep spiritual tradition that's older than Christianity. And uh, it has some amazing saints and yogis there. And if you try to tell this Christian that, you know, hey, you know, Jesus was great, but, you know, there exist amazing yogis and saints in India. You can go find these saints who were as amazing and special as Jesus. This can't compute in a fundamentalist Christian's mind. See? Because... Uh, that's not what his holy book says, and his holy book contains the absolute truth. And if he was to open his possibility to the fact that maybe Hinduism actually does certain things better, maybe Hindu spirituality is more advanced than Western spirituality, this would be, this would be an existential crisis for this person. Because he was raised to believe, since he was five years old, that... Uh, the, the Hindus are heathens and that the Christians are the, the ultimate faith. Sometimes conformity at this stage happens in a nonconformist way, which can be a little bit twisted and, and tricky. So sometimes you're going to conform to the traditional mainstream groups like Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, whatever. Other times though, and you see this a lot of times like in high school, is that kids will conform in a nonconformist way. Like they will become goths or they will become punks or they will become uh, like these emo kids or whatever, where they, they conform to some kind of subculture. They turn that into a dogma. You know, they start getting all the same tattoos, the same piercings, dressing all the same, believing the same stuff, having the same gripes and criticisms of society and whatever, reading the same existentialist philosophy, you know, nihilism or whatever. Um, and they think that in this way, they think that they're being rebellious or nonconformist when actually the structure there, the content might be nonconformist, but the structure of the mind is very conformist. And then of course, they will probably grow out of that as they get older. So, uh, so watch out for that. You know, conformity doesn't mean that you only conform to the mainstream content. Sometimes you will conform to some sort of niche content, but you're still very conformist about it. Like you can join a cult which believes some crazy things. You know, you can join a cult which believes that aliens from Mars are coming to save us 
uh, from, you know, from destruction, from nuclear annihilation, whatever. You can believe that. You could think that, well, but I'm not being conformist because I'm believing in aliens and I'm believing in, you know, things that are contrary to, to Christian mainstream uh, beliefs in my culture. But actually, you're, you're part of a cult. So, yeah, you're very, very conformist. Uh, in fact, that could even be worse because at least mainstream conformity has been sort of uh, mollified to a point where, you know, mainstream Christianity, it's not completely fucking crazy uh, because it was in the past, but we've sort of, we've toned it down. The mainstream Christianity is sort of, it's nice. It's, it's not too violent and so forth. But then when you get into some, some crazy esoteric fundamentalist sect of Christianity or of Islam, that's when things get crazy. That's when, uh, you know, it can get very violent or um, abusive in various sorts of ways. And that's actually what, uh, that's what like Wahhabism is with Islam. You know, mainstream Islam is, it's pretty tame. It's not too violent or, or crazy. But then when you get into some of these radical strains of it, that's, that's when it can get very dangerous. That's where a lot of the sort of terrorists come from. It's not mainstream Islam. So that's a distinction that, of course, many people fail to make at this stage. Uh, anger at this stage is suppressed for the sake of conformity. So a lot of times a conformist can be seething with anger on the inside, but they will hide it in public, which again can bubble up and explode in very dangerous ways at certain times. The main defense mechanisms at this stage are projection and demonization. Sense of self uh, is denied by others. Relationships have a needy quality to them at this stage. There's a sort of sense of like, I will conform for you, and then that means you have to conform for me. And if you fail to conform for me, then I get angry and upset with you. And so that, that creates sort of a codependency there. Uh, at this stage, there is an interest in the concrete and visible aspects of reality. This stage thinks and feels in cliches, but takes them as not cliches. This is an interesting point. Uh, you might have noticed this, where uh, you, you, you see this with conservatives a lot on TV. They will start talking in cliches. Or if you start to debate, for example, a fundamentalist person, they will start to issue talking points to you. And you can tell very clearly if you're at an advanced stage, you can tell that they're just parroting talking points that they absorbed from somebody who told them these talking points and that they never actually sat down and thought through these talking points themselves. They're just parroting them. They don't know what they really mean. They don't know what they're talking about. But they're using these cliches and talking points as though they're not cliches, as though they're original thinking. So they're parroting stuff, but they don't even know that they're a parrot or a robot, that they've been culturally programmed with this stuff. And they're just, they're basically just transferring this mind virus from one conformist person to another. It can be quite amusing and baffling, uh, but at this stage, the mind isn't able to self-reflect enough to see these cliches. Uh, great value is put upon appearance, status symbols, material possessions, reputation, and prestige. This stage cares deeply about others' opinions of them. The main anxiety of this stage is not to belong. It's being rejected by the group. It's a loss of self as defined relative to others. So here the self, the ego, is very much defined by its relationship to its in-group. At this stage, emerging problems tend to be denied, relabeled, and whitewashed. Um... And you see this a lot with, with climate change, for example. There's a lot of denial about it. Uh, it's a serious emerging problem, but, but conformist people, like I said before, their minds are so rigid that they're poor at dealing and adapting to evolutionary changes. And since reality is evolving all the time, we're constantly being forced to deal with new survival challenges. And so this can be a, a, a severe disadvantage for a conformist person because the conformist person is just used to, you know, 
fitting a certain predefined role and just doing things the way that our ancestors have traditionally done them. Now, that can be very effective as long as the environment and culture in which we're doing things is the same. But if things are changing, for example, our ancestors never had to deal with climate change. So, of course, today's conformists, they have a hard time wrapping their mind around climate change because it's not part of their tradition. Because, of course, it's a new emerging dynamic. And there's always new stuff emerging. There's new technologies. And of course, these conformist people oftentimes have a very difficult time dealing with new technology. And so they can come off sort of like cavemen uh, because, you know, they will be against birth control. That's a technology. They will be against, uh, what? Um, against pornography. That's a new technology. They will be against media like for example certain you know puritanical sects of christianity like uh, the shakers and quakers and uh, and uh, mennonites and so forth you know they they live this very simple kind of lifestyle where they don't even drive cars they don't use computers uh, again cuz they want to live in a very traditional way and they, they think that that's going to work but it's not you can't survive in the world just by maintaining your old traditions and being a quaker because like the world is going to take you take you over. There's competition. You need to be always adapting to, to you know to new challenges. So of course that doesn't mean technology is always a positive. There's always positives and negatives with technology. But you see to deal with those positives and negatives both. This requires a sort of mental flexibility and taking on that challenge as a responsibility. So again, the mind can either take that challenge on or it can deny that challenge and say, no, I have nothing to do with that thing at all. I'm not going to even allow that into my field of vision. A lot of conformist people will, will choose to behave that way about certain aspects of society or technology or the media or whatever. Um, that's why conservatives are often against stuff like uh, genetic engineering Stem cells, they used to be against those. Um, you know, cloning. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that there's not problems. There are serious problems with cloning and genetic engineering, but usually it's the conservatives who tend to yell and bitch and moan about these things because uh, their mind simply doesn't know how to grapple with these new challenges. And of course, there are very serious challenges that come with these new technologies. How do we make sure they're not abused? How do we adapt our moral system to take into account the new possibilities that are opened up by new technologies? But see, when you have a rigid absolutistic moral system, which is basically grounded in the technologies of 2,000 years ago, how does a modern-day Christian who's a fundamentalist and believes in the Ten Commandments, how's he or she going to deal with cloning and stem cells and genetic engineering and birth control? These things which didn't exist back then. They want to try to drag a, you know, a philosophy and a, a moral system from 2,000 years ago into the present and try to use that to make sense of, of current reality. And it, is, it doesn't work because we've, we've evolved so much. But their worldview doesn't even acknowledge this evolution. It's not even as bad as they think. You know, they think that, oh, well, evolution just applies to animals. No, it's much worse than that. The problem is much deeper than that. Evolution applies to, to culture, to religion, to language, to society, to everything. Even Christianity itself has evolved so much over the last 2,000 years that the Christianity of today has nothing to do with the Christianity of 2,000 years ago. But of course, <laughs> there's no way they can admit that. That's way too threatening to admit that Christianity evolves. Uh, at this stage, asking a superior what to do is the most natural way to deal with difficulties. So people who are in jobs at the conformist stage, they're not outside the box thinkers. They're not going to be out there creating crazy new innovations, finding new ways of doing things. They're just going to be doing things the old way. So if your business requires a lot of innovation, these people... They're not going to fit well with your business. Conformist people try to avoid conflict because they don't want to upset the group. At least conflict within their in-group. They're fine with conflict between their in-group and everybody else, the out-group. 
These people are drawn to organizations with clearly defined identity and hierarchy. These people want clear instructions, orders, and a role to fill. Conformist people love to tell others what to do and exactly how to do it in a black and white way. So you might relate to this example. Probably your parents, many of your parents will be from the conformist stage. And so your parents might love to give you advice about how to live your life. And they will tell you exactly how you should live your life. What kind of clothes you should buy, what kind of car you should drive, what kind of job you should get, how you should comb your hair, what kind of music you should listen to. Like they have, uh, you know, they have very strong opinions about this and they are absolute and confident. So confident in, uh, in their advice for you that there's no possibility of these people guiding you and being open to the fact that you're an individual with your own set of values, your own worldview, your own preferences, and that maybe the way that your mom wants you to comb your hair is not how you want to comb your hair. And the kind of music your mom listens to is not the kind of music you want to listen to. And, you know, when your parents go to church, maybe you don't agree with going to church. You have a different, you know, style or whatever. Maybe for you, spirituality is not about going to church. It's about meditation or smoking pot. But of course, your mom and your dad are not going to be open to that because for them, there's just a black and white way of doing things their way. They can't see beyond their own preferences. They think at this stage, the mind thinks that the mind's preferences are what everybody's preferences are and ought to be. And if they aren't this way, that means because you're evil. Not because you have a different value system, which is equally valid, just different. And that there are different ways of living in the world, different styles of living, different ways of surviving. You know, different generations have different needs. No, they're just evil and wrong. This is why your mom gives you the kind of advice she does. And she keeps, you know, she, you keep telling her, no, mom, I, I want to live my life my way, the way I want to live it. What you're telling me might work for you, but it doesn't work for me. That doesn't compute in her mind. See, everything is evaluated according to one's own preferences. The vocabulary at this stage for feelings is very simple and undifferentiated. These people don't have a rich awareness of the different subtleties and different emotions that can be felt because a lot of times they're suppressing their emotions. They're also suppressing their own needs and wants. The ego has certain unique needs and wants, but these need to be suppressed to fit in for the good of the tribe, for the good of the group. At this stage, the mind must use discipline to fit in and to deny unacceptable emotions and animal urges in order to be good and therefore to be accepted and praised by the in-group. And so a lot of the reward for the mind is the approval it gets from its in-group. And at this stage, the mind values gaining rank and status within one's in-group. All right, so we've covered that. In a lot of detail, let's move on to the next stage, the expert stage. This is still within the conventional stages. The expert is able to step back and look at oneself as an object from a distance. There's beginnings of self-reflection, but they are rudimentary. It's rudimentary self-reflection. Mostly, the mind is still focused outwards. Now, there's a want to be different from others, to be unique. So at this stage, the mind works hard to differentiate itself from the family and to express its newly found personhood. It feels good being noticed as unique. Uh, at this stage, there's a want to be respected for one's knowledge and one's abilities. There's an emphasis on agency and individualism. There's a focus on finding one's own voice. The mind now is capable of dealing with abstract objects and concepts, and it starts to assert itself and its unique needs and wants. The old conformist sense of self is now seen as fake and inauthentic and uh, not so important as it once was. There is a vision now of how one would like to change to be more successful. Success, personal success, takes precedence over conformity to the group or the pleasure that one gets 
for conforming. Now the pleasure is about being unique and taking ownership of that uniqueness. Uh, there tends to be a compulsive, perfectionistic tendency here to outdo oneself, to be the best. And the ego gets a lot of pride and sense of fulfillment and meaning from knowing that it's the best. The best in sports, the best in business, the best father, the best mother, the best um, whatever. Uh, this stage perceives negative feedback as a personal rebuke. So it's still defensive and not really able to take constructive criticism here. Uh, inadequacies of others are seen as what makes life difficult. So if only others weren't so inadequate, then life would be great. But my life is difficult because everybody else is being stupid and not stepping up and being successful. This stage enjoys criticizing others as a way to establish one's own sense of superiority and power. So you know these people, you see these people on YouTube all the time. These YouTubers whose entire lives is about the joy of criticizing others, ranting about the other side, whether it's liberals or conservatives that they're ranting against, or they're ranting against religious people, or they're ranting against atheists, whatever they're ranting against, or they're ranting against spiritual hippies, and they just make a whole identity out of ranting about them and just bashing them and just uh, this sort of uh, intellectual superiority. At this stage, the mind starts to question authority and group dogma. So a lot of times the mind starts to feel like it's so smart because, hey, you know, everybody else is a sheep and I'm not a sheep. I'm this unique individual. And look at how smart I am. I'm questioning authority. Of course, <laughs> in reality, uh, the mind here is just tricking itself on a higher level and it, it's still being a sheep and it's still not really truly questioning authority very deeply. It's only questioning the most flagrant and idiotic forms of authority. There's still many ways in which authority is not fully questioned uh, and understood. At this stage, the one's own way of doing things is seen as the right way and as the best way, the superior way. The mind here is identified with cutting edge knowledge and expertise. It loves to acquire knowledge. Uh, knowledge and expertise is what makes one special and better than all of those sheep who just believe in religious fundamentalist myths. Knowledge and expertise, that's the truth. It's not myth. The mind here becomes overly focused on details versus the big picture. It's focused on doing the task right rather than doing the right task. It's still not very good about thinking about, is this task really important in the big picture? What is this really going to do for mankind? That's still not something this level of development is good at thinking about. But it is good at doing tasks well and doing them efficiently. So there's difficulty prioritizing and applying wisdom to one's decisions. This stage tends to reject old conformist and family beliefs in favor of professional peer groups, degrees, authorities, and reference books and science. Here, authority is given to science, and science now becomes the new religion. Except it's not seen as a religion, it's seen as the opposite of religion. It's seen as the true way for how to understand reality. There's religion and myth, which is all bullshit, and then there's science, which everybody knows is true. And if you don't understand that science is true, and that religion and myth is bullshit, then you're an idiot. That's how a person at this stage thinks. And then there's a, there's a superiority complex that comes with that. It's like, oh, I'm so smart because I can see that myth and religion and fundamentalism is stupid. Well, you're not as smart as you think you are. <laughs> there's a lot of arrogance at this stage. This stage tend to think, tends to feel righteous and superior. It tends to feel like it, it knows everything now. It tends to feel like it can explain the whole world because it's shed the mythology of religion. And it's like, oh yeah, the religion was so stupid and I, I've transcended that, I've moved beyond it, and now I'm at the top. It's this kind of sense. Of course, that's nowhere near true. You're only at the top in your own mind. 
um, there can be a sort of a, a faking in your own mind. There's just like a fantasy built up of how great you are, of how you're the best, you're the top. You're the, you have the most expertise, the most wisdom, the most knowledge, when in fact you don't, but your mind is faking it because your ego needs that so much to feel like it's truly the best within its profession or within its worldview or within the group or whatever. There's an interesting relationship with the group. Your group is still needed at this point, but one stands out at the periphery of the group, threatening to leave the group without ever mustering the courage to leave. So you're still kind of reliant on the validation of others, but at the same time, you're not completely hinging your whole identity on it. So you're kind of stuck in the middle there. Uh, the self feels like it has life all figured out at this stage and that it knows all the answers. Uh, it feels disappointed in oneself for not performing better because there's a sense of that you have to be this performer and you have to be successful. There's a, still a strong sense of shoulds and oughts at this stage of how you should behave, what's correct, what's incorrect. This stage doesn't easily collaborate with others because it wants to be the sole contributor and it wants to get all the glory for itself. This stage tends to be very argumentative and opinionated with uh, intellect weaponized and the intellect becomes aggressive. There's a severe criticism of how others think and there's a, a, a severe superiority and the superiority complex is very easily activated by the, <laughs> by the stupidity of others. Uh, this sort of ego lives in a world where things are sure and clear. It doesn't uh, realize that one's perspective is one of many valid perspectives. It knows the truth and it knows that the best, uh, that its approach is the best approach. It loves to create efficiencies and perfected processes. It gets a lot of satisfaction out of being efficient with work, with business, with its morning routine and with its diet and with its exercise and all this sorts of stuff. This is the sort of stage at which people start to tap into a little bit of self-help and self-improvement. They might start weightlifting. They might start um, uh, trying to become better at their job, trying to become the best at, at their work, starting to read books to help them to do that. But also off at this stage, the person is overworked because they're trying so hard to be the best and to be so efficient. Uh, at this stage, the mind has a hard time delegating tasks because it's perfectionistic. It'll often delegate a task, but then take the task back because the task wasn't done to its overly perfectionistic anal standards. Smart assery is very common. <laughs> Smart assery is common at this stage. Um, the ego at this stage loves to have the last word. Something could be told to the ego, and then the ego will say, yes, 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 I understood all that, but let me have the last word and tell you why I'm ultimately right. There can be a hostile sense of humor here. Ridiculing others as sport becomes popular. The defense mechanism at this stage is hyper-rationalism. Everything is intellectualized, rationalized, and explained away. Anything that doesn't fit one's rational worldview is just dismissed as myth and religion and nonsense without realizing that rationality itself is just one epistemic modality and that it has severe limits and that there can be things that are true and very important and profound, but which cannot be rationalized or explained with logic or with uh, traditional materialistic science. All of that stuff is seen as woo, hippie bullshit. Uh, this is this is this is the stage from which a lot of people love to judge and uh, to sort of demonize uh, Deepak Chopra. <laughs> people who quote Deepak Chopra as like the bad guy. <laughs> These are the ultra rationalists. Uh, a lot of people at this expert stage they tend to be technocrats, bureaucrats, highly educated specialists. They relish being movers and initiators. Of course, a lot of uh, business types and executive types tend to come from these stages. A lot of pickup people come from these stages um, where you're, you're trying to 
take ownership over your sexuality and over your dating life. Here, of course, sexuality starts to sort of open up. Now sexuality is not so repressed as it used to be. And so here, the pendulum can swing in the opposite direction where before you were this choir boy who didn't want to have sex until marriage, and now you swing the pendulum in the other way where now you become this sort of douchebag pickup artist where you want to have sex with hundreds of women um, just for the sake of having sex with them, and then you don't even want to have relationships with them, just sex. And all you care about is how many women you, you have sex with and how hot they are, and you rank every woman on a scale of one to ten and so forth. So it, it, the pendulum swings like that. Um, at this stage, the ego feels entitled to impose its sense of uh, its, its views on others. There's a pragmatic leadership style that's unencumbered by existential questions or complexities or externalities and collateral damage. Like, if we can get something done, let's just do it, earn some money. That means it's good. We don't have to think about the repercussions on the environment, or should we even do this? Is this spiritually right? Is this moral? Is this conscious? None of that matters at this stage. The, the superego is, is very strong at this stage, but it's unavailable for introspection. The superego is that part of your mind which tells you what is right and what is wrong and what you should be doing. This stage is concerned with fulfilling adult responsibilities and duties. It's very adept at finding new and different solutions, um, better ideas, and more perfect procedures and ways of doing things. There's a sense and attitude at this stage of, if I can do it, you can do it too. You know, just like, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, work harder, sleep less, and just get it done. Just do it. Stop being lazy. Stop creating excuses. Just go out there and do it. And this is seen to be sort of like the solution to all of mankind's problems. Um, this stage often blames the structure, tools, or incompetence of others for things that are not working in the world or within its own sphere. Uh, no one can tell an expert anything they don't already know. The main anxiety at this stage is losing one's sense of specialness. The expert shows a strong front by not admitting ignorance or vulnerability. So not knowing is seen as a very bad thing. There's no openness to not knowing. Everything must be known. And if there's something I don't know and I admit it, that means something's wrong with me. I'm being weak. Language is starting to become more nuanced at this stage of development. There's a minor use of qualifications and conditionals now. So when someone is speaking, they're qualifying their statements. They're not saying that this is absolutely true. They're saying, if this, then that. Or they're saying, this is probably true. It's probabilistic. There's 99% chance that God doesn't exist. Stuff like that. So there's, there's a little bit of openness. There's, a, there's maybe a 1% openness that maybe God could exist. But 99% chance that he doesn't. That's how an expert tends to think. Uh, and there tends to be a, now an early interest in causality. The question of, why something is happening starts to become a little bit important, but not really, just a little bit. The expert starts to wonder, why? Why is this happening? Why am I here? Why does life exist? This, a little bit of this kind of thinking starts to come online, just a little bit. Which brings us to the last conventional stage, which is the achiever. So after expert comes achiever. Achiever is a little bit more developed. The achiever wants to discover oneself by exploring past experiences and thinking about one's ideal self. The achiever has a five to ten years forwards and backwards time frame, envisioning where you're going to be in five years, where you were five years ago. Uh, the achiever realizes that you can continue to grow in mind and heart as an adult. So here, this that sort of attitude that I talk about of lifelong learning comes online at the achiever stage. The achiever is excited by self-knowledge and self-improvement. So this is really where self-help becomes popular. This is probably the stage at which you will discover serious self-help. Uh, many of you probably got on board with actualize.org at this stage if you were following me from the very beginning. 
before I was even talking about any kind of spiritual topics. And this is this is where people get into Tony Robbins and that type of success-oriented self-help. And also basic psychology. Now you're interested in psychology more. You're interested in your own emotions and how your own mind works a little bit more than previous stages, which didn't really care. This is also why when you try to introduce self-help or actualize.org to your parents or your friends who are at the lower conventional stages, they don't get it or they don't care uh, or they don't understand the significance of the discovery because you're probably at the achiever stage, which is towards the high end of the conventional stages, and they are at the lower end of the conventional stages, like the conformist or the expert, where they don't yet see the value of psychological understanding, of psychoanalysis, of, of self reading self-help books, and so forth. See, and, and so you won't be able to get through to them until they ra rise to this achiever stage. There is now an increasing independence and self-authorship. You're really starting to take ownership of your unique qualities and actualizing yourself. You're beginning to appreciate conceptual complexity. You can see alternatives in problem solving. There's not just one right way to solve a problem. There are a multitude of ways to choose from. The, uh, the achiever can see that the way a problem is framed is the problem itself. So it's a little bit of a more meta style of problem solving. The achiever can now notice contradiction and inconsistencies both within himself and his belief systems. The achiever is planful and capable of reorienting towards new goals. The achiever is still convinced very much in the scientific method and doesn't question it very much. The achiever is looking for rational laws that explain human behavior and how the universe works. Uh, much of science is done from this achiever stage. It's sort of traditional materialist science. Uh, the kind of stuff that you see in universities a lot. Um, the achiever works towards the betterment of humanity now, more and more so this is going to be happening as we move up the stages. The achiever is convinced that once Solutions, his solutions will be the best for all of mankind. There's not yet a sense that different people from different perspectives need different solutions. This doesn't compute yet at this level. Uh, the achiever is better at working in a collaborative environment. They are less lone wolves. Uh, the achiever recognizes that making new distinctions is important for expanding one's mind. The achiever can create complex theories and models, but even though they're able to do that, their models and theories tend to stay at the intellectual level, and it doesn't really end up transforming their internal consciousness very much. So they can have all sorts of lofty theories about mankind and the, the mind and the world and evolution and so forth, but the way they actually live their life isn't touched by that, as it will be in higher levels. The achiever actively asks to find out what makes others tick. The achiever now cares what makes others tick, whereas lower stages did not care. The achiever explores causes of oneself and others' behaviors. So now we're getting more psychological. The achiever is starting to notice how much psychology is shaping life and one's ability to be successful and to achieve. And so the achiever now starts to care about one's own psychology and the psychology of others. It becomes sort of a curiosity. The achiever trusts in the potential to improve oneself through effort, learning, and feedback, which is sort of a prerequisite for self-help. The achiever can take feedback now, unlike the earlier stages, uh, without his identity being threatened. So constructive criticism becomes possible now. And the achiever can now even take misguided criticism and see it as useful, find utility in it. Uh, at this stage, people tend to be interested in taking personality tests, courses, retreats, and workshops. So you'll find a lot of these achiever types at these sorts of retreats and workshops if you attend them. Um, 
there's a concern now with reasons, causes, goals, consequences, and effective use of one's time. Now the mind is able to understand itself backwards and forwards through time. So now you're thinking about your childhood and your early adolescence and adulthood, and you're, you're kind of connecting dots and saying like, oh yeah, today I have certain preferences and biases because that's how I was raised. That's the culture I came from. You connect all those dots from the past to the present. It's sort of a psychoanalytic uh, perspective. There's a motivation to classify and understand other human beings. The achiever is interested in knowing the root causes and reasons for unwanted behavior. So they're less defensive and more open to really taking responsibility for their behavior and introspecting and, and really trying to get to the bottom of why is this unwanted behavior keep happening in my life. The achiever starts to realize that self-deception is a thing. And the importance of distinguishing appearance from reality, feeling, and what is being said versus what is being left unsaid. So even though the achiever does start to realize a little bit of self-deception, uh, the achiever still has almost no idea of how profound self-deception is and how deeply the mind is able to trick itself in constructing reality. Just basic self-deception is starting to be realized. The achiever, for example, many achievers will start to talk about things like cognitive biases, confirmation bias, sampling bias, etc. But even when they talk about these cognitive biases, they really have no depth of understanding of, of how deep the mind's biases run. And so, in a sense, talking about cognitive biases itself just becomes one more further extra layer of self-deception, which prevents the mind from understanding how deep the self-deception really goes. Because when people start talking about self-deception or self -bi or I mean, um, uh, cognitive biases, they're talking about it on such a superficial level, and a lot of times they're they're externalizing it like, oh well, yeah, I can see the self-deception in others. I can see how others are engaging in these various cognitive biases, but I can't quite see the depth of it within myself. I can't see how rationality itself is a cognitive bias. Science itself is a cognitive bias. There's a willingness of achievers now to explore feelings that don't fit their current understanding of themselves. So you're starting to connect more with feelings that were suppressed and denied. But still, very much achievers are, are living in their heads rather than in their bodies. Uh, achievers are less likely to ignore, deny, and project onto others, although they will still do so to some extent. Achievers are becoming familiar with their own biases and defenses, but again, just mildly so. At this stage, one can consciously use negative energy in productive ways. At this stage, there's an exaggerated sense of responsibility for actualizing one's potential. You start to take self-actualization seriously. Uh, there's guilt for not being more successful or more developed. At this stage, the achiever doesn't yet see oneself as, as an interdependent part of multiple overarching systems. It still sort of stands as an individual apart from different systems, social systems, and so on, the environment, and so on. There's a, a desire to live according to one's chosen values rather than the values of society or family. Now the achiever questions the shoulds of society and of one's profession. So here you can start to become a little bit more creative and an outside the box thinker with your profession and not just do things the way that they've been traditionally done. Now you can actually innovate a bit more. Uh, there's guilt for having made wrong choices and regret for missed opportunities. You might look back into your life and you might sort of kick yourself and, and say, damn, I wish I discovered self-help 20 years ago, what that would have done for me. But of course, 20 years ago, even if you discovered it, you would have just thrown it away because you were at a stage probably lower than achiever where you wouldn't have been able to see its importance. Only now you can see its importance. Severe self-criticism is a common fault of this stage. The achiever doesn't yet understand that not everyone 
is at their level of development. They don't see differences in development. They expect everyone to be achievers, which, of course, is silly and leads to all sorts of absurdities and problems and misunderstandings. The achiever is more appreciative of diversity of people and perspective than the prior stages. Interpersonal relationships now become more intense and more important for the achiever. They're not just selfishly using people to gratify themselves. Now they're actually more interested in actually forming some deeper relationships. Others can now be valued for who they are rather than how they serve oneself. The, ach the achiever chooses how to proceed based on one's own critical examination of what works and what is important. The achiever no longer derives meaning exclusively from one's narrow professional expertise. There's a sort of a broadening sense of one's self-image and importance and one's uh, function in the world. It's not just my little narrow profession, but something more than that. It's about growing myself. It's about actualizing myself. The achiever values knowledge and wisdom from thought leaders. So now the achiever starts watching TED Talks <laughs> incessantly, valuing all this profound knowledge that these TED Talks seem to provide. Although TED Talks are actually a very crude form of knowledge and wisdom, but it can seem very profound if you've just discovered them. The achiever can belong to multiple diverse groups with different identities and agendas at the same time without being internally, mentally torn apart. They can sort of hold multiple groups in their mind, whereas, like, the conformist couldn't do that. Uh, the achiever is driven to improve the world. So a lot of times, entrepreneurs and Silicon Valley types will be these achiever types. Uh, there's a feeling of urgency now, as time is ticking, and there's so much left to do. There's so many ways in which the world can be improved. There's so many cool technologies that can be built and developed and yet not enough time to do it all. This is why the achiever is often times overworked and overstressed. Uh, the achiever can get preoccupied with getting things done with responsibility, conscientiousness, and expediency. Issues of legacy and contribution to society start to become an important factor in one's self-image at this stage. Achievers may create complex theories of psychology or philosophy, but mostly they're still at the level of theories, and they're, not, they're still not very holistic theories. There's a drive to achieve uh, that can lead to overexhaustion and burnout. Uh, it can be hard for achievers to slow down and to appreciate the present moment because they're so future-oriented. And because of that, work-life balance issues become very common, if you've seen sort of motivational speakers and, and business coaches on YouTube talking about how you need to be working, you know, 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, and so forth, this, this, is, this is what creates work-life balance problems and burnout. Uh, at this stage, not trying to figure things out is no longer an option. Achievers tend to be obsessed with scientific rationality and analysis. Their mode of understanding the world is analyzing everything to death. Intellectual skepticism is exhibited towards things that are not yet proven in a material, demonstrable, official way. Um, so everything needs to be scientific. Everything needs to be logical and mathematically formulable, quantifiable. Achievers are very big on quantification of things. If it can't be quantified, it, it isn't real. There's a belief that the laws of the universe can be figured out and proven if we just try hard enough. So even if, even if we haven't proven everything yet, eventually we can. We just need to keep doing more science, do it faster, and then we'll prove more, and then eventually we'll understand everything. That's the idea here. The achiever feels in control of life, generally speaking. This can feel very empowering, but also it comes with a downside in that if you ever start to lose control, this can be a major threat to your identity. Much energy goes towards reaching one's goals at this stage while remaining independent. There's a strong push towards independence. There's a fear of losing independence and autonomy. Achievers have a sense of responsibility towards others even while pursuing their own agenda. So they're pursuing business a little bit more consciously than prior stages. 
There is now a consciousness of the importance of communication and uh, an appreciation for the uh, mutual expression of different feelings and ideas. Achievers are interested in analyzing and questioning their own thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. They are open to continuous learning and self-improvement, unlike earlier stages. Common defense mechanisms here are intellectualization, rationalization, and suppression of the shadow. Uh, achievers often suffer from depression due to guilt for not living up to their ideals. So every stage has its own versions of depression. It gets depressed in different ways. And so this one here at this stage has a lot to do with underachieving. Obviously enough. There is a fear of loss of control and autonomy. There's a fear of getting sucked back into conformity or subsumed into someone else's scheme. There's a fear of loss of progress. Achievers have a greater ability to listen to others' experiences without projecting their own interpretations onto them. Achievers are able to encourage others to discover their own solutions more so than prior stages. Achievers accept facts and the material world as real. So very much materialism reigns here at this stage. There's a blindness to the way that beliefs shape reality. There's a blindness to how materialism itself is a, is a construction of the mind. Science is taken for granted as true here. Scientific assumptions are rarely questioned. Knowledge, measurement, and prediction are taken for granted. And uh, beliefs, uh, uh, at this stage, the achiever believes that most problems can be solved with technology. So... That concludes the Achiever portion, and that really concludes part one. Now, at this point, we've covered the pre-conventional and all the conventional stages. But wait, don't go yet. We're not done. I want to make some general remarks about this ego development model. And then uh, we'll talk about part two a little bit too. So, what you need to understand about this model is that People's responses don't all fit into one category. You're not just going to be an achiever or just a conformist or just an opportunist. People's responses tend to fall into three adjacent levels. All right? So if I was reading these different points to you and you were resonating with a little bit of the conformist and some of the expert and then a lot of the achiever, that's not wrong. That's exactly right. You have a center of gravity of where you fall, and then your center of gravity is what is consistently accessible to you under ordinary circumstances. So depending on how stressed you are, you're going to slide further down this scale to the lower stages. And then if your life is going great and everything is working out for you, you're probably going to be peaking into one stage higher beyond your center of gravity and experiencing what that feels like. But then you're probably going to fall back down to your sort of baseline where you are when your life isn't too great and it isn't too bad. Sort of in the middle, that's your, that's your baseline, that's your center of gravity. So just keep that in mind. Uh, it's okay if, if you resonate with multiple of these. Also, you should probably notice that throughout your life, you've resonated with one of the earlier stages more so, and now you've kind of outgrown it and moved up to higher stages. Uh, also... You should distinguish between horizontal development and vertical development. So this model is all about vertical development. Vertical development means changing the structure of your reality and sense of self. Which is more significant than horizontal development. Horizontal development is expansion at the same plane within the same structure. It's sort of like sifting through more content within the same ego structure and the same mental models of reality. For example, uh, you can get better and better at your career as an achiever. You can keep getting better and better, learning more, reading more books of the same basic sort, learning more science, building up your materialist worldview, um, questioning religion more and more, but that still keeps you within that achiever range. Or Maybe you're a conformist, you know, fundamentalist Christian, and you can keep, you know, being a better Christian. You can rise through the Christian organizations, gain rank and status, 
become a, a priest or a preacher or whatever, or a missionary, and um, you can learn more about the Bible, and you can become more moral, and you can grow. You can eat healthier, and you can um, you can be a better father and a better mother, but all still within that fundamentalist Christian paradigm. So this is what we call horizontal movement, whereas vertical movement would be realizing that, oh, that entire Christian paradigm, that was all a construction of my mind, and now I'm moving beyond that. That would be vertical. So vertical is more difficult than horizontal. Most people who do self-help do it in the horizontal direction because it's more safe for the ego. And uh, most self-help material is designed just to do horizontal growth, not vertical growth. Because vertical growth is more scary, it requires more, more depth, it requires more time, more effort, it requires a, a, a longer vision because it takes more time. Usually to move up one vertical stage takes five years of solid, consistent work. And most people aren't even doing any self-improvement work at all. So they're not even growing horizontally, most people. Your parents probably aren't even growing horizontally. But still, plenty of people grow horizontally as well. Very few people grow vertically. Especially beyond the conventional stages. See, it's easy to grow vertically to the achiever stage, to the last conventional stage. Because that's sort of like what our culture in a developed society in America, in Canada, in Western Europe, uh, in, in Scandinavia, in Japan, maybe, like, you know, in these countries, the achiever stage is seen as sort of the pinnacle of what it means to be a, a highly functioning adult. This is what many business leaders and educators and scientists and politicians strive to be. This is what many celebrities are and strive to be. This is a lot of what our culture is about. Our education system is about trying to basically make you an achiever. Even me most self-help books and courses are about how to turn you into an achiever. And then nothing beyond that is really conveyed or even marketed to you. Our entire marketing system does not go above post-conventional, basically. And so it's very easy to rise up to the achiever stage and then get stuck there permanently because how would you ever find out about anything beyond that? So that's why part two is going to be so important to open your mind to those new higher possibilities. Also, what I should point out about this model is that the levels alternate in a snaking sort of motion. You can think of a swinging pendulum between differentiation and integration of the ego self. So what this means is that when you start off in that unit, uh, not unit, but that symbiotic stage, um, your sense of self is so undifferentiated that there's no difference between self and world and other. But then there's a differentiation that happens and you start to see yourself more as an individual separate from your parents, separate from your, uh, from the external world or environment. You become an individual. But then as you do that, you sort of become a loner, too individualized. And then you realize that, wait a minute, that's too painful. It doesn't work because I'm part of a society, part of a community, part of a group. Now you start to reintegrate with society, and now you become more of a conformist. You start to you know, go to church and um, conform with your friends and play nice at work and so on. And so you integrate. But then if there, you know, the next stage... The, uh, after the conformist, you know, the, the expert, it shifts backwards towards differentiation. Now you realize that, oh, I was too conformist, I was being too much of a sheeple, and now I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to develop myself, and I'm going to be more unique, I'm going to try to play up my uniqueness, I'm going to get more value from my own uniqueness, so there's that differentiation. Then, of course, it reintegrates back and forth, and this keeps happening. But it's not just a ball that bounces back and forth, there's also movement, so it bounces back and forth, but it also goes up. And in fact, that's why we call it a spiral, because it, it circles around, but it, 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 it moves upwards as well. And you should also just, I think it's helpful to really see the significance of each stage by just reaffirming to yourself that basically each stage is its own bubble, its own separate reality. A person stuck in one of these stages, they really are living in a different reality. 
because the way there's no such thing as reality in an absolute sense, so to speak. What there is, is there's different perspectives upon reality, but most people don't realize that, so they just conflate their perspective with reality itself. Uh, you don't realize what I just said is true until you get to the post-conventional stages, which we haven't even talked about yet. Um, which is why there can be this sort of sense that some people are so crazy, like conservatives seem crazy to liberals. And conversely, liberals seem crazy to conservatives. It's almost as though they're living in different realities. That's because they are. That's because there's a liberal reality and there's a conservative reality. There's a Christian reality, there's a Muslim reality, there's a Buddhist reality, there's a Hindu reality. There's a male reality, there's a female reality. There's an achiever reality, an expert reality, conformist reality, all these different realities. But none of this is recognized at the conventional and pre-conventional stages. And you can see how problematic and dangerous that is because everyone just assumes that there's only one reality, their reality. They're confusing their perspective with reality itself. Lastly, let me just say why this model is so valuable and important, if you can't see it already. Let me make it explicit for you. First of all, this model is so important because it shows you what healthy human development and maturity looks like. These stages follow in a certain simple sequence. This is how you will develop and evolve. You're not some special unique snowflake such that you are above this model. This is a roadmap. This is a roadmap for your own growth and development. Also, the reason this roadmap is so valuable, I mean, you can literally use this to grow yourself. And in fact, I'll show you how to do that in future episodes. Um, if you haven't figured it out yourself yet. This model shows you the traps. All the traps that you make, that people make, where they get stuck for years and decades. You can avoid those traps if you just take this model seriously and you look one stage ahead, you can see the traps. That's invaluable. And lastly, the reason this model is so important is that it helps you to understand others without demonizing or judging them. Whether others are lower than you or higher than you on this model, doesn't matter. This model will help you to understand where others are coming from. It'll help you to appreciate that. And that itself will give you the perspective that you need in order to grow. Remember, what growth ultimately is here for the mind is just higher and higher perspective taking. See, so just by exposing yourself to more perspectives, to deeper and broader perspectives, that in and of itself is going to grow you and help you to avoid many of these traps. All right, that's it for part one. Next time, we'll talk about part two, the most exciting part, the post-conventional and the transhuman, the transcendent stages. So make sure that you stick around with me for that. I'm done here. Please click that like button for me. Don't forget, that helps the video to get more views, helps me with the channel, get more subscribers. Uh, I need that because, you know, this is, this is rare, advanced stuff. It's hard to market this stuff. It's hard to get a lot of people to view this material because it's complex, it's long, takes a lot of explanation. It's not very sexy in many ways. So please click that like button and come check out actualize.org. That's my website. You will find my blog where I post material all the time, exclusive stuff, videos, links that I share, resources that I find. It supplements uh, what I do here on YouTube. Uh, stuff that I can't share through YouTube, I share on my blog. So don't, uh, don't miss that. Also check out my life purpose course. If you're an achiever type, the Life Purpose course will, will suit you very well. Uh, check out my book list, which will help you to, to find new sources of information, new perspectives, just blow your whole mind open with amazing books that I have on there. And uh, a lot of the books that I share, there are very rare that you're, ne you're never going to hear from anybody else. I don't just share the common books that everybody knows about. I share rare books that few people know about. The, the most powerful books that I've used 
in educating my own self. Uh, that book list has been foundational for my own growth and development over the last 10 years or so. So don't take that for granted as a resource. It will change your whole life if you start reading those books. In fact, I expect you to. If you're watching my videos and you're not reading those books, you're not going to you're not even going to get half or a quarter of what I'm really talking about. It's just it's not going to work. You need to you need to read and as you're reading you got to contemplate this stuff for yourself. Watching my videos is not going to be enough. And come check out the forum where you can interact and share and talk about this stuff. We have a lot of interesting conversations and share a lot of examples on the forum and clear up a lot of confusion. And finally, you can support me. If you like my work, you can donate five bucks on uh, patreon.com slash actualized. All right, that's it. I'll see you in part two.